Okay. So, this is a talk called Nuclear Powered Software Security. It's got two main themes that we'll run through it. The first is something that most of you probably won't have encountered whilst developing PHP, um, safety critical systems. The second one is something which you should all have encountered and be taking very seriously, which is software security. The goal behind this talk is to show you some of the techniques that are used by engineers who work on safety critical systems, such as power plants, planes, that kind of thing, where failures can result in loss of life, and see what we can borrow to help secure software against vulnerabilities and, and attackers who might want to, to damage the systems that we work on. First thing I want to bring up, some of this talk isn't going to cover, lists. You've probably heard of a few quite famous lists about security. We're going we're gonna to ignore those for this talk and we're going to focus on general purpose techniques instead. Um, people have a tendency to try and reduce security to looking at items on a list and ticking off boxes and say, it's okay, I've covered these 10 items, my software is secure. Trouble is, if you do that, what about number 11? The one that didn't quite make it to the list. That's the one that's going to get you. Okay, so, so this is going to be looking at more generalized techniques that you can use to improve security as a, as a whole across not just your, your software, but across the whole organization. Obviously, this talk is named Nuclear Powered Software Security. Um, so you've probably guessed that we're going to be having a look at nuclear power plants. Now, when we talk about nuclear power, a lot of people find it quite frightening as a, as a concept because their mind jumps to this. However, that's not a nuclear power plant. It's a nuclear bomb. Nuclear bombs are not very safe, so we're not actually going to look at those today. Um, in fact, it's actually quite hard to make most nuclear material explode in that way. Um, and a typical nuclear reactor won't contain enough material to cause such a nuclear explosion. So if it can't go boom, you, your power plant can't explode and, and take out half a city, what's the problem? Well, there's actually a more dangerous part to a nuclear plant, which is the actual radio mater radioactive material contained within it. It's really dangerous to human life. And unlike something like gas, which comes out of your stove, perhaps, you can't detect it yourself. You can't sort of smell it. You can't feel it. Um, so it's kind of an invisible uh, pollutant in the environment that, that can cause great damage to, to all living beings without you actually realizing it. So it's really important for nuclear power plants to prevent any of this radioactive material from leaving the plant and getting into the environment as a whole. To understand why this is quite a hard problem, we're going to have a look at how a nuclear power plant actually works. As with the majority of power plants, the general mechanism by which electricity is generated is to produce heat. Coal plants, gas plants, they, they burn coal and gas. Nuclear plants use a nuclear process to produce heat. This heat then goes on to drive uh, to boil water, which is then used to drive a turbine. That then generates electricity. Now, unlike when you burn, um, burn coal, which just sort of burns and, and produces heat that way, with nuclear power, you are breaking down an atom. You are splitting things apart. And when that happens, there's a, there's a physical reaction there, which splits and you get two or more different atoms from what you started with and a lot, large amount of energy released. Um, however, the problem with this process is it, it's self-sustaining. So once you kind of kick it off and, and start it, the reaction produces neutrons and those neutrons go on to trigger further reactions in the, in the plant. This means you can't turn it off very easily. Um, because, because this reaction is self-sustaining, you can, you can control it, you can slow it down, but you can't stop it entirely. That means that even if you turn off your power plant and, and stop it producing electricity, it's still sitting there producing heat. And if, you, if your power plant cannot remove that heat and get rid of it, that heat's going to start accumulating and eventually causing damage to the actual plant. Um, so it's vital, one of the most important things over all others in a nuclear power plant to do is, for
for it to be able to remove heat from the core, even in the face of multiple failures in its systems, it needs to be able to cool that, keep that core cool and remove that heat to prevent damage to the reactor. So, we've identified something which we really do not want to happen to our nuclear power plants, a meltdown. That's what happens if, if the fuel gets too hot, the fuel rods melt, and, and some of that radioactive material can, can escape the reactor and into the environment. We've also identified something which could lead to that undesirable outcome. If cooling fails, if the pumps that pump the water around the plant that keeps it cool fail and they stop pumping water, um, we, we, we could end up in a situation where that plant overheats and, and melts down. In doing these two steps, we've already taken the first step towards the first technique I'm going to look at today, which is called fault tree analysis. Fault tree analysis is a technique to analyse things which can go wrong in a system, starting from an outcome that you don't want, and tracing back to all the events that can lead up to that, that thing happening. You can then take a look at your tree and analyse ways to mitigate each of the, each of the compounding events and stop, um, stop failures from propagating up and cut, cut them off um, and reduce the probability of, of the bad event that you want to stop actually occurring. Let's take a look at a simple example. You can see on this, this sort of tree we've got at the top there, loss of cooling. We don't want that to happen. And at the bottom here we've got a couple of events which could lead to that. If we get a power failure to the pumps, they're going to stop pumping the water around. Um, also, if you had a, like a block of valve in the system somewhere, that might impede the water flow and stop it from, from pumping around. Now, these failures on our tree are combined using a Boolean OR gate in the middle there. Look. Now, that's because either one of these two failures could occur and lead to that loss of cooling. Um, we could expand the tree out and say, well, you know what, we, we've got backup systems for this loss of power. We, we have, we have um, we're both electricity being supplied by the, the grid, um, so from all the power plants, and we have a backup diesel generator in case, you know, something happens to that power supply, if, if the wind knocks the power lines out or something, we can spin up a diesel generator and, and, um, and to produce electricity for it that way. Um, so here, before we get to this loss of power event, we, we have to have both of these sources of electricity fail. So we combine them using an AND gate on our tree. Um, further, we can also say that we're not worried about losing power while the reactor is running, because obviously while it's running, it's generating its own source of electricity. So we can use that electricity, some of that electricity that's generated, to power the pumps. We represent this using a gate that you, you've probably not come across before, but it's called an inhibit gate. What that does, in a, in a fault, what that represents in a fault tree, is that there's, there's a conditional to the, to the right here that says the reactor's got to be off, which means that we can ignore everything below that gate unless the condition is, is satisfied. Um, now, you sort of see this tree and you're sort of thinking, well, okay, the reactor's got to be off, your national grid connection's got to go down, your diesel generators have got to fail somehow. That seems pretty unlikely. That's, that sounds like it would be pretty safe, right? But this failure is exactly what happened at Fukushima in, in Japan a few years ago. Uh, an earthquake happened and the reactor got shut down for safety reasons because that's their, their sort of safety procedure. In the event of an earthquake, shut the reactor down and, and, and try and keep it cool and under control. So that meant that the reactor was off. The earthquake also took out the power lines that were supplying the, the reactor from, with an external source of power from the, the national grid. Um, and that meant that when, when the plant an hour or so later got swamped by a, a tidal wave, which took out their diesel generators, they suddenly found themselves with no power to drive their pumps. And that's what led to all of the, uh, the various plants exploding and, and, and breaking over the next week or so. Um, so they weren't able to keep them cool. Now, you might have sort of thought, well, okay, that's a nuclear power plant, but 
I don't really work with nuclear power plants. I work with shopping carts and I work with business systems. But we can, we can use the same technique to look at security. If you're, if we imagine an e-commerce site, we're storing lots of information about your customers. We've got their address, we've got their purchase history, we've maybe even got credit card details in there. One really bad thing to do, especially given the, the GDPR legislation that's come in recently, would be if that customer data was, was stolen by an attacker um, and leaked to, to other people. Because um, that, that could end up costing you a fortune, um, as well as reputational damage. So we've got a bad thing, customer data being stolen. And what we can do, we, we can sort of sit down in your teams, your development teams, and with some business people, and we say, okay, well, what, what kind of events could happen which would lead up to that customer data being stolen? And you might sort of think, well, well maybe, maybe some attacker might be able to log into the database directly somehow. They might be able to get the credentials. They might be able to log into our database and just, just download it, do an SQL dump. Um, you might also think, well, OK, we, we've, we've got a customer service department. Someone might be able to like, ring up and maybe trick the customer service agent on the end of the line in, into revealing some of that data to them. I mean, they're possibly not going to be able to get the whole database, but maybe if they, they, they trick the customer service agent into maybe getting an admin account out, that could, could allow them to, to sort of get in and do a, do a large export. So again, we, we, we plot these, these events on a, on a tree, and given that either one of those could lead to a bad thing happening, we put our all gate at the top there. And... We, we can continue this, this analysis. We can say, well, okay, let's, let's take a look at the, the customer service branch. There's lots of different ways that an attacker might be able to, to get into our customer service admin panel. Um, they might do some, some, some session hijacking and, and steal a login cookie from, a, from an existing session running in a, a browser. Um, they might try and social engineer information over the phone. Or they might just manage to guess a weak password and, and log in to the the customer service portal. Now, you've got this tree, you've done this analysis, so the next thing you want to start doing with it is you want to consider the risks. You want to have a look at all of those events and say, well, what, what's the likelihood that this event might happen? You know, what, what, how, how likely is it that someone's going to phone up and try and social engineer one of our customer service reps, for example? For the highest risk factors, they're the places you focus first. They're going to give you the most return on your investment. Um, you may consider some items as having quite a low risk of happening. Um, so you might say, well, we're, we're quite okay to, to ignore those for the time being. We know that they exist, we know that there's a risk there, but we consider it to be a low risk, so we're going to focus our efforts elsewhere. Then, for the ones that you've identified as, as being a high risk or or, or easy to exploit. You want to consider what mitigations you can put in place. Um, an example for the, the customer service problem would be to put two-factor authentication on, on your service accounts so that if someone gets the password, they're still not going to be able to get into that admin panel. This turns that guess or steal password branch from the, the, one of the previous slides into, from an, into an OR gate, from an OR gate into an AND gate. They require both the password and to somehow get their hands on that security token, that hardware key, before they can log into the account. Um, and that, that can make it much more difficult for an attacker to, to gain access. Obviously, there's still a risk there, but you've, you've mitigated it and you've massively reduced that risk. Not all mitigations that you're going to be doing are necessarily going to be technical. Um, one, of the, one of the risks that we had on there was, was the risk of social engineering attacks on your, your customer service engine. Someone phoning up and claiming to be someone they're not and trying to get their information out. There are some technical solutions we could consider for this. I have seen some companies implement some things. Um, but to get the risk down to acceptable levels for some things, you're going to have to think about non-technical solutions, think about people. Start training your staff in, in recognising calls that may be a little bit suspicious and just taking a bit of extra care before just handing out information over the phone. Verify you know, that it is an account holder, ask them to confirm the date of birth or something like that as, as an additional defence. Okay. In the previous section, obviously, 
we highlighted a important technique for identifying and analyzing potential causes of failure in a system, uh, tracking their root causes and taking measures to prevent them. Defense in depth is another general purpose technique that we can use when thinking about software security. Um, just dealing with the root cause of an issue is, is often insufficient. Um, in, in software security, this kind of thinking leads to very fragile security systems. Um, a lot of big corporations for a long while had this big, huge firewall. Okay? It was at the perimeter of the network and it had lots of rules, lots of security in place, lots of restrictions. And the idea was that it prevented the big bad internet from accessing their squishy internal network. Um, it's, pretty good. it's a pretty good security technique. If you've got a really well managed firewall, it can stop a lot of, a lot of issues before they even get inside. Um, if it didn't, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be hearing about software breaches every few days, because it is a technique that people do deploy especially larger corporations. Um, this tough outer shell can actually be very effective at preventing breaches, but what happens when someone does get inside? If that's your only layer of defense, once an attacker breaches that perimeter, it's game over. They can access everything inside your corporate network and the security there is, is a lower level because you are relying on that tough outer shell to protect your squishy in a network. Everything is connected. Modern day computer systems rely on so many different interconnected parts, it is completely inconceivable that we can build one which doesn't have a security failure waiting to happen somewhere inside it. Some piece of software that's, that's got a bug that can be exploited. So the concept of defense in depth is how we can limit the damage once a component of your system has actually been compromised. Go back to the example of a nuclear power plant and consider how, how nuclear power plants um, use defense in depth as a safety measure. You remember the reaction vessel where the, the nuclear reaction happens? Each, there are multiple layers inside that reaction chamber which help prevent radioactive material from the, the fuel cells in the middle from escaping to the outside world. Um, we've got a perimeter around the plant to prevent the impact of any, you know, so that they've got like a fenced off plant. Um, we have a reactor case itself, which is usually several feet thick concrete. Um, and then, then there's a the reaction vessel, which is fairly thick steel. And even the, the fuel rods themselves, it's not just raw uranium or plutonium or, or whatever fuel they're using. It's usually encased in something which is solid and, and tries to help prevent that material from breaking up and small amounts getting out. Now, if you think about the fault tree diagram, the practical, offense, uh, the practical effect of defense in depth is to turn one of those OR gates where any failure underneath leads to your bad outcome happening into an AND gate where you've got multiple layers which all have to fail before your bad event happens. Um, so defense in depth is a really good technique for reducing the chance of failures propagating out. If you've got a sort of a one layer in your, in your system and someone manages to penetrate it, but the next layer is just as secure, they've got to start over all over again. And they've got to try and get further in before they can actually get at what they're after. So if we take a look at the other branch of the tree from the e-commerce system and consider the risk of an attacker getting access to the database, we, we could extend it, as is, as is shown on the slide. We could sort of say, well, maybe they'll get direct access. Maybe we've accidentally left it open to the internet and they can just log in, they can get the IP, they can log into the database and do an SQL dump. Or maybe they, they've, they've somehow managed to compromise the web server and they've got in there and they've found the credentials on the web server to log into your database, and they're doing it that way. So there's a couple of routes they can go in. One level of defense in depth we could have here would be to put a username and password on the database. Um, that obviously means that, you know, if, if someone does just come across your server running on an IP address, hopefully the, the password is strong enough to keep them out, and you, you've, got a, you've got an extra layer of defense from them just logging in. 
Um, obviously, if, if the web attacker were to compromise the web server, though, that layer doesn't help you. So that nullifies the defense. It's not to say that requiring the credentials for your, for your database is not a good idea, because it's, it's just that it's insufficient on its own. Remember that the key here is to have multiple levels of defense, so you've got layers of protection that someone has to get through. Another level we might consider would be to encrypt the data in the database. That means that the attacker would need the key to read the data, as well as being able to download the data. At first, this might seem to have the same problem as, as with the database credentials. You're going to need them on your web server so your web server can connect to the database and, and decrypt the data. However, um, Cryptogra, we, we actually have some solutions for this. Um, we could actually store our keys in a, in a hardware token, which makes it very difficult for an attacker to, to copy the keys off the server. So if they wanted to download a, a dump of our database, they would have to sit there decrypting all the data and downloading it while on the server. This is much slower and would give your monitoring solutions a chance to go, hold on a minute, why is that node over there at 100% CPU? Hopefully someone thinks to investigate and finds someone who shouldn't be logged on, trying to download and decrypt all your data and turns the node off and opens an incident and you, you start trying to find out what went wrong and, and fixing it. So hopefully you can stop them before they actually get away with your data. Again, another layer of defense, which, which can help prevent loss of your customer data. The third technique we're going to move on to is called zonal analysis. Um, it's a technique using, uh, that's used with safety central systems, but it's, um, it's most common in, in the aircraft industry. So we're going to take a step away from nuclear power plants for, for a moment. Um, the idea is to look for common causes of failure within a system. Um, a common cause for failures is quite concerning as it can turn something that looks like an AND gate on your initial fault tree diagram into an OR gate. If a single failure, if a single thing can be compromised by, um, by one vulnerability, then you effectively turn it into an OR gate because compromising one of those things allows them to compromise the others and, and move on. Um, so have a, have a think about what, what, what this actually means in practice. We'll take a case study. Um, on July 19th, 1989, uh, a McDonnell Douglas DC-1010 crashed after experiencing a, a failure in, in zonal, a zonal failure. So I know this is a picture of one of the aircraft here. I don't know if you can see, it's a bit odd for an aircraft, but it's got this third engine on the tail. Most aircraft don't have that. And um, so the design of the plane had three engines. It had three redundant control systems, all powered by hydraulics. So the idea being, if, if one of your hydraulic systems fails, you've still got two systems left, which you could use to you know, change the angle of the flaps on the wings and, and mount the tail rudder. Now, unfortunately, what happened is, is shortly after takeoff of this plane, it, uh, the, the third engine at the back there, the, the fins on the, on, the, on the jet engine, one of them broke off, sliced straight through the engine casing and straight through all three hydraulic lines, um, which, despite the fact they had three redundant systems, all three of them went in one go. And I don't know if anybody here flies planes, but I don't. I'm told it's really difficult to fly a plane when you don't have any hydraulics in it, and you're meant to. Um, now, turns out, quite luckily for, for the, the passengers, that the, the pilot of the plane was a really experienced glider pilot. And not only that, but the senior trainer for flight instructors uh, was a passenger on the plane. Now, between the two of them, they managed something completely miraculous without any, any control over the sort of like the airfoils on the, on the wings and the tail. They managed to control the plane simply by varying power to the remaining two left and right engines and bring it into a kind of a crash-ish landing on a disused airstrip a long way away from any popular built-up areas. And, and the, 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 they were actually managed to save most of the lives of the passengers on, on the plane, which was, given the state the plane was in after the failure, was pretty much a miracle. Um, but when, when you're in a situation where, where something goes wrong, you don't want to rely on being really lucky about having the right people 
to solve your problem. Um, you, you want a little bit more certainty than that. Now, you might think, OK, what, what can we learn from that? For physical systems, such as a plane or a nuclear power plant, zonal analysis is fairly straightforward. Usually, it, looks, it involves looking at a system and saying, you know, if, if that thing over there explodes, is it going to take out like its redundant backup system? Or is it going to take out something else that's important? And if you go, well, actually, yes, because that thing next to it is quite important, you move it over there. So that if it explodes, that thing's still OK. Now, this might seem initially, it's, it's a physical problem of proximity, but it doesn't really translate to a computer system. Generally, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I have never worked with a computer system which might explode. Um, we, we, we can take from this, though, um, when moving into this realm of system security, is to look out of, for areas which might cause a compromise of multiple systems based on the failure of just one critical link. So an example, administrator passwords. If you've got an administrator with, with high level access across your systems, they might be able to log into all your servers, including your database, your web servers. If an attacker manages to compromise the credentials for that admin account, they could have free reign across your entire system. So even though each individual node might be really secure, they've got a master key that unlocks all those gates and they, they can get on. Obviously, what we can do here is, is require really strong passwords for your admin accounts, require two-factor authentication, um, and, and, and consider something like segregating your admin account. So you've got a database administrator account, a web server administrator account, so to, to reduce this risk. Um, another area of concern would be systems which are shared across several services. So especially common in microservices and things like that, you might have a centralized logging server or a backup storage server or a centralized database server. If someone was to claim access to one of those systems, they could potentially leverage that to compromise multiple other areas of your application. Obviously, what you need to do is make sure these systems are better defended than others because the risk of compromise is, is much greater. Um, doing things like not logging sensitive information, like passwords, encrypting your backups, that kind of thing, taking an extra layer of defense on these systems, which, which might be of higher risk. Um, operating system vulnerabilities. The, this is a really core cool one. You are probably using the same operating system for all the, all the different kinds of server that you're using in your application stack. Now, if you've got a, a vulnerability in the underlying operating system, that someone can find. They can use that to bounce from host to host to host. Um, the now not so recent ransomware attacks, which a year or so back swept through the, the UK's National Health Service and quite a lot of other companies worldwide, is, a, is an example of this zonal failure. Um, a single failure within uh, Microsoft Windows allowed a ransomware worm to spread unchecked between different computers on the network um, really, really fast. Now, that allowed it, once it got inside the organization behind that big firewall, behind that defense perimeter, to copy itself between hosts indiscriminately, um, spreading the infection really quickly. Um, if greater attention had been paid up front to isolating systems, I mean, does, does the station that the nurse uses to check patient details need to be able to talk directly to the one the doctor uses? Probably not. If they were blocked from talking to each other directly, it would have slowed the, the progress of that work through the to the hospitals. This also highlights the importance of keeping up to date with security patches, especially on your operating systems and other core pieces of software. Okay, because if you if you keep up to date with the patches, then there was a patch for the problem that, that the NHS was hit by, but they haven't updated, they haven't patched, so they got hit. Assume that everything is connected. Every, every computer that you've got connected to a network is wide open to the internet. If you're trying to reduce a system's vulnerability to these zonal security problems, by assuming this, your, that your systems are directly connected to the internet, you take stronger precautions on them. Be suspicious of all traffic coming from outside of the perimeter of a system. If you've got a web server and something's trying to make database connections into it, that should be getting blocked. You shouldn't be allowing that to happen. Thinking this way will get you a long way to, towards stopping the damage caused by an attacker once they've breached that tough outer shell. 
Another form of zonal analysis we can perform on our systems is to consider the data stored within our systems. By looking at components within our system which have access to di various different types and pieces of company data, we can identify hotspots which are especially vulnerable. This could be data which is large in volume. So if you've got your main company database with all your product order history, that's a large volume of data. Or it might be something that's high value, so a store of credit card information or, or medical information. Assuming that your goal is to prevent leaking this data, these identified hotspots are the biggest risk to your organization. Focusing on these hotspots will provide a good return investment. They're what an attacker is after. They're what they're going after. So if you put money into defending the points at which you've got the most valuable or the most quantity of data, you're going to get a higher return on your, your time spent securing those systems than if you, if you secure a minor, minor system that, that doesn't hold any data somewhere on the side. A more robust long-term strategy, also helpful with the GDPR, which has come in, is to reduce the amount of data in these hotspots. Think, um, does a customer service agent need to be able to access company financial information, um, employee data? Do you need to store those on the same database? Can you store those off, off your main website in a different system? Can you split the data up? Do you need all the data? Do you need history of product orders going back to the start of time? Or do you only need to keep the most recent three or four years worth? Can you delete it? Could, if you do need that for historic purposes, can you archive it offline? Okay. If you start thinking about these things, you, you reduce the, the risk if something does actually go wrong. Another of the key design criteria for any system related to safety is the ability to fail safely. In practice, this means that if a system encounters a fault, it should be able to shut itself down into a safe state and preserve its safety um, constraints and guarantees. With a nuclear power plant, we'll go back to, remember that the key aspect to ensuring its safety is to be able to remove that excess heat from a reactor, even after the reactor itself has been shut down. So, I mean, a talk on nuclear power plants and safety couldn't be complete without a look at probably the most famous accident in history. Um, I don't know if anybody recognises that up there, the image there, but it's um, the Chernobyl plant, um, which, which occurred back in 1986, 32 years ago now. Um, Russian scientists were performing an experiment on the number four reactor at Chernobyl. Um, they disabled a lot of the automatic safety systems which, which protect the reactor in, in the event of things going wrong, so they could perform this experiment. And they were operate, operating the reactor outside of its designed limits. Um, a, a, another reactor elsewhere in the country had, had gone down, and so there was a greater need for power. So instead of going through their planned um, shutdown, or the safe shutdown of the reactor to perform this experiment, it had been running hot, right up to the minute that they performed the experiment. And what sort of happened is they, they started to shut it down to, to perform their experiment too quickly. And the trouble with the, the reactor design that was used in Chernobyl is that as it, it's cooled by water, and water is really good at um, absorbing the neutrons which are produ produced by nuclear um, fission which is what propagates the reaction and, and keeps it going. But the problem is, steam isn't. So you've got water which is absorbing these neutrons and preventing your nuclear reaction from going out of control. And then it does. So it starts getting hotter and hotter. And what happens is the water boils. And as the water boils, it becomes less effective at absorbing the neutrons which, are, which can keep the reaction under control so there are more neutrons floating around, which exponentially increases the speed of the reaction, which increases the speed of the water boiling off. And eventually, the, the pressure inside the reaction vessel gets really high, because steam is higher pressure than the water. And that is what led to the accident, and that's what led to the, the reactor exploding and catching fire. This is an example of not failing safe. Um, when, when something went wrong, instead of the reactor 
calmly shutting down, the failure actually made the problem worse and it went into a runaway reaction. And obviously you, you know the rest of what happened with that reactor. Now, to sort of contrast that, there are some newer designs of reactor which aren't in service yet. They're sort of like um, new, newer, newer designs which we're going to be bringing in over the next few decades, I imagine. Um, for example, this one that's, that's on the slide is called a, a pebble bed reactor. Now, if you remember the diagram at the beginning of the slide, you had the fuel rods which were contained in, in a metal container to keep the fuel um, safe. Um, but instead of that, in, in a pebble bed reactor, the, the very small amounts of the, the nuclear fuel is contained within a ball of carbon. Now what happens with this is, as the reaction heats up, as the reactor heats up, the balls of carbon expand, which pushes the bits of radioactive material that are participating in the reaction slightly further away from each other, which works to slow the reaction down. The hotter it gets, the slower the reaction gets, and then it cools back down again until it reaches an equilibrium state. This actually means that even if your primary cooling, your water pumps, fail, the reactor can actually keep going and it sort of, as it heats up, it, it keeps itself cool so it reaches a stable temperature and doesn't actually need active cooling. Um, so in the event that all your, your systems fail, your reactor isn't actually going to explode because it will just sort of keep ticking over. When we're building security systems, we want them to fail in a secure manner. That is that when something goes wrong, we don't want that to reduce the security of the application. A good example of this is HTTPS. If you enable both HTTP and HTTPS, an attacker can actually force the browser to fall back to HTTP, or just bad HTTP algorithm, HTTPS algorithms, which are broken in the event of a failure. Browsers will also default to trying to connect to a, a website over HTTP if they, if they can't reach it over HTTPS. This could allow um, cookies and things like that and, and personal user data to be sent over an unsecured HTTP connection, which is then able to be intercepted by, a, by an attacker. Obviously, we've got a, a mechanism that we can use to defend against that, HTST. That forces browsers to always connect through HTTPS and not fall back to HTTP. That's an example of failing secure. If it can't connect over HTTPS, it won't connect at all. What happens when something goes wrong? There are many other examples of systems which don't fail in a secure manner, or that leak information such as stack traces or database queries, database errors, when something goes wrong. As with everything else in this talk, the important thing to take away isn't a list of items to look out for, but a question to ask yourself. What happens with my system if something breaks? What information, extra information, am I going to give to an attacker? Can an attacker leverage that information to gain further access to my system? Okay. Displaying a generic error message is much better than displaying a detailed error stack on your production systems because they might figure out that, oh, you're using a vulnerable version of your framework, I know I exploit for that, and then they can go ahead and use it. If you're just displaying a generic error message, it's harder for them to find that out. Okay, final section of this talk, um, user interfaces. This is possibly something that's overlooked when you're talking about security, but even if you build a reasonably safe and secure system, there is another the user interfaces are an area which can compromise the reliability of that security or safety system. How do you let users know that something isn't quite right with the system? How do you let them know that something has gone wrong? This is something that both the nuclear power industry and the aerospace industry has put some effort into getting right in the wake of several accidents, both on planes and, and this next example. Now, again, I'm probably thinking that nobody in the room will recognize this one. Um, it's an American power plant, it's Three Mile Island. It's a nuclear power plant which had uh, the first major accident that involved a nuclear plant ever, and a civilian reactor. On the 29th of March 1978, it suffered a meltdown after the cooling failure that we've been describing throughout the talk occurred. 
The primary cause of this meltdown was a, a valve in the cooling system which was stuck open, um, which allowed a lot of the water coolant inside the reactor to, to drain off, meaning that the, the reactor was not actually submerged in water properly and, and wasn't being cooled correctly. But this was compounded by human factors. Um, the, the operators were quite stressed when this happened. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't quite understand what the instrumentation was telling them. There was an indicator light which told them what was going wrong, exactly what was wrong with the system, exactly why it was going wrong. But it was hidden away at the back of a panel somewhere, and nobody noticed it for hours until it was way, way, way too late. It was only when the shift changed the next morning and a new, new team of engineers came in and, and re-evaluated the situation that someone went, well, why is that light flashing? Obviously, this, this bad design of the instrumentation panel, which didn't surface the really important information quickly, meant that that problem wasn't diagnosed in time to fix it. And obviously, the reactor melted down and quite a lot of radioactive material was, was released into the atmosphere. Again, you, user interface is an area that we, we concentrate a lot on in, in software engineering. Hands up if, if you've seen something like this before. Just put my hands up. Okay. Um, what about, would, would you click yes? Yes, this pops up. You're, you're installing a piece of software. Um, brand new game you just bought. You want to install it, you want to use it. Would you click yes? Hands up. Yeah. Would you click yes on that one? Still okay? Yeah? Keep your hands up. Yeah. Okay. This one? And another? This one? Oh. Let's have a look at that last one again. Who had their hands up? I think that, that, that illustrates kind of an important point. If, if you've got these, say, a security log in your system that's saying, oh, yes, this has gone wrong, this has gone wrong, this has gone wrong, this has gone wrong, you're training your users to ignore them. So that when something really bad goes wrong, they don't notice it. It's lost in the noise. Obviously, the, the, the guidelines in this section are, are mostly going to be concerning administrative interfaces um, for dealing with security incidents on your platform. For less technical users, these items, you, you need to apply these guidelines a bit more strictly. So when you're designing a UI to, to give out security information to your users about issues or potential problems with the security, you want to start out by highlighting only the most important information, things which are out of the ordinary. You don't want, yes, this is working fine, over and over. Don't provide too much detail up front. Give them a headline of what's gone wrong and allow them to drill down into your interface to get more information if they needed it. As I just demonstrated, you stop paying attention when you see lots of these messages coming in over and over. And they stop paying attention when it really matters. Just because you don't want to swamp users with information and you're only giving them the highest priority items doesn't mean that you should throw away other information. Allow your experts to dig in and track them down the cause of an image uh, of an incident or dismiss it as, as something that's not actually, not actually a huge issue. OK, finally, we'll conclude the talk. Safety critical software engineering is based on the principle that you cannot make a system which is 100% safe 100% of the time. However, the techniques used to analyze the behavior of a system, which could lead to it becoming unsafe, allows for mitigation of the most common issues which could lead to system failure. The same is true of security. It's unlikely anyone will ever build a system which doesn't have bugs in it and that's 100% secure. But by using some of the techniques used to engineering safety, we can have a look at how we can engineer better security and mitigate the most common issues which lead to things going wrong. So, to recap briefly, we looked at fault tree analysis, a method to analyze undesirable outcomes and trace back to what might cause them. The extent you take this to depends on the level of risk you're willing to accept. It could be an exercise to carry out on a whiteboard with colleagues to cover the main areas when you go back to work on Monday. You might decide to go to further extremes and vigorously document every detail of your system, especially if you're storing a lot of very highly sensitive information, credit card details, medical details. Your auditors will love you for that. If, if you can present them with this document and say, well, this, this is the risk analysis we've taken, tick, done. Layer your defences. When you've identified the areas of concern, layer defences around them. Don't rely on the fact that an application is on your internal network. 
You should still use HTTPS. You should still have usernames and passwords. You should still put the appropriate security layers in place regardless. Look out for single points of failure. There's something to be aware of. Systems which, if compromised, can lead to further compromise of your application. Try and reduce the impact of a failure and take greater care with your security considerations around key components of your system. Handle failures securely. Make sure you consider failure cases and what happens in the event of, of things going offline, unexpected things happening. If you're relying on a third party authentication service, what happens when it goes offline? Will it lock everyone out or will it allow unlimited access to your system? You want the former, not the latter. And finally, consider your users. Human factors can often be the greatest weakness of an otherwise secure system. Take care that the work that you do on securing systems isn't undone by a careless user going, this is annoying, go away. Remember that security at the expense of usability comes at the expense of security. Okay, thank you very much. I hope everyone's found this really interesting. Um, There's also my, my blog link where the, the slides for this talk have been listed. And there's also a joined in link if, if you want to leave any feedback on, on what you thought about the talk. I don't think we've got time for questions because we started a bit late. No, no questions. Okay, so if, if you've got any questions, I'm doing another talk right now. But if you come find me in an hour at a time, I'll be sort of in the bar somewhere and you can, you can ask any questions if you've, if you've got anything you'd like to, to discuss. Thank you very much.